Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, I would like to make a special request to Sister Dawn Thomas to please edit whenever Elder Leslie has to introduce this pastor. I want you to edit and redact his, invita uh, his introduction. I always have to hold my head. I don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> Um, but you know, we are good friends, um, you know, we come from the Caribbean, and um, you know, it's always a battle between me and him, so I, I, you know, I'll give him today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and get myself ready to come back for him another day, you know, but it's just such a joy to be able to work together with a great group of men and women here at Wilson, and um, um, you know, the pastor is only as strong as his team, and all what Elder Leslie mentioned cannot be possible without you, so I want to put back the credit to you as a church. Um, our cooperation together makes it possible. You can, you can have a good pastor and no cooperation, nothing gets done. So I thank God for giving me a wonderful group of members who are committed to the mission of the church. Yeah. And you have helped me to become a better person, a better pastor. Before I get into the word of God this morning, and I know I have only, I see Ella Glendon looking at me at the corner of the eye and telling me, watch at the time, watch the time. <laughs> um... I want to remind you, I know Ella Allen would have already this Thursday, Elder Butcher, but, uh, Ella, but Brother Primus Butcher will be laid to rest. And um, at the funeral service, I, I, yesterday I was told it was going to start at 11.30. Uh, 11.30. So please, um, let's all come out and support uh, Sister Butcher as she lay her husband to rest. We are having some little challenges with the shipping company for Haiti. Um, I want you to pray for that for me, please. Pray for that. Yesterday, whole day, we were trying to sort out some little technical issues. Um, boats are not going to Haiti very often, so please pray for that um, um, and the challenges we are having with the shipping company for Haiti. Then finally, uh, two things rather, not finally, two things. The 16th to the 23rd of June of October, we want to have at this church a sanctuary series. It's called New Perspectives on the Heavenly Sanctuary. So uh, the plan is that we are going to be, every evening I'm going to be here, we're inviting you to come out. But if you don't want to come out, we're going to bring it live online for you. So from October 16th to the 23rd, for the whole week, I'll be sharing with you on the heavenly sanctuary right from this pulpit. And on the 23rd, we have a big baptism. Come October 23rd, we have men and women already signed up for baptism. So that's the plan. And then the next week, the 30th of October, we want to have a day of reflection, praise, and thanksgiving. We have been cast down but not destroyed. Amen. Those of you who are at home, you got to be here on October 30th. Amen. Because we want to come back here, hold your mask, but come with a whole heap of praise. Amen. God deserves a mighty praise. Amen. So we are planning a big Thanksgiving service here. I know we came back to church and we're a little low-key. But we want to take it up a step higher on October 30th. Come with your testimonies. Come with your thanksgiving. And we want to have a, a hallelujah time here on October 30th. So put that date in your diary. Invite your friends. And those of you who have not come out as yet, yeah, I want you to plan for October 38th, okay? And, um, uh, you know, don't tell me that um, you're shielding. 
you know, come out on October 30th. Of course, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Um, but we want to have we want to have a great time here on October 30th by the grace of God, uh, giving thanks to the Lord. This morning, I must confess, I had difficulty thinking about what should I speak about uh, for Harvest Festival, but I want to just commend Sister Elsie Staple and the PM team for this wonderful idea. And Sister Staple, this is just the start of better things to come. I believe the Harvest Festival should be every year. So I want to thank you, Sister Staple, for this idea that you came up with. And together, you shared the vision. We embraced it. And it's a reality today. And I believe, um, you know, on my way down, I could take an apple. You know, such a lovely, such a lovely uh, display here this morning. Um, and so, I... I you know, in, in, your, in your program, the title says, Don't Take All. It should be, Don't Eat All. I don't know why, take, why, why I text take. The, the, the title of the message is, Don't Eat All. Leave a little. Don't Eat All. Leave a little. Let us pray. Father in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we are celebrating the goodness of God in our lives. And while we celebrate, I, you know, I want to pause to remember the many people who do not have. Because while we have to eat, there are parts of this world, and even here in this country, where people go without food. And not just that, but the wanton wastage that occurs in our society. You know, today I want to say that no one should go hungry. There is just too much food for people to go hungry. And yet still, they tell me that one third of the food we produce go to waste. Every year, 1.3 billion ton, tons of food are thrown away. In fact, it's enough food to give everyone 10 meals per day. Here in the United Kingdom, 9.5 million tons of food were wasted in 2018, according to the Waste and Resource Action Program. And if we exclude the inedible parts of food, uh, they tell me that 4.5 million tons of what is thrown away can be eaten. It means that there is a lot of wastage happening. And while we are celebrating the, the bountiful harvest of the Lord today, I want us to be, to recommit our efforts to avoid wastage. Every food you throw away, Someone could have gotten it. In fact, they tell me that wastage of food costs this country over 19 billion annually. And uh, what is interesting here is the number of household wastage. You know, we are talking about food and the bountiful harvest of the Lord. But I recognize that when you have it a lot, sometimes we don't understand that that potato that you throw away, that rice or provision that you throw away, there is someone who needed it that could have made use of it. I remember the Rasta man who 
was on top of the tree and he said, Ja, I and I eating the last banana. And after that, I and I will die. Ate the banana, threw the skin down, and a vagrant passed and took the skin and ate it. And he said, what, Ja? Things ain't bad with me after all. I want to say, folks, we may not have much to give, but the little you have is more than a lot of people. Because there are people and parts of this world that literally go to bed hungry. Now, my mother used to, when she put food on the plate, if you leave back, she used to beat you. You know, she, um, she used to say, you're eating what I give you. And um, um, sometimes, you know, she cooked things you don't like. You know, um, you know, one time my mother bring home some bitter gourd, Coraili. <laughs> you know, Coraili, bitter. And she put a little, she put peace on the plate. They got to eat it. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, and, and growing up, I didn't like okra, okra too much. But, you know, I, I mean, I had to get to like it by force. And, you know, you know, and, and, and. Dashin, you know, I only grow to love dashin later on. My mother used to like to put dashin on the plate. She said, but, but you're not going to waste it. And I only now understand, as I grew up, what she was teaching me. That you don't throw food away. Take what you can eat. Sometimes, and that's why I don't like potlucks and buffets. Because it tempts you to fool your plate. And you take a whole heap of food, but you can't eat it. Well, let me say this, folks. Not because you see a lot, you have to take a lot. Uh, there are times you've got to take a little, finish it. And then go back. Rather than take plenty and then dump it. You see folks. The way we deal with food has a lot to do with our spirituality. Because God hates wastage. Particularly in the kitchen. Now they tell me that right here in the United Kingdom... Um, every uh, uh, household, um, 41% of the food that household throw away is thrown away because it has not been used in time. 28% is because you don't like it. It's your personal preference. 25% go into the rubbish because individual cook, prepared, or serve too much food. And so while we have a lot here that we can throw away. There are 811 million people that go to bed hungry every night. In fact, the country of Haiti that we are sending these supplies to, Haiti is the, is the fourth country in the world that is leading in hunger and malnourishment. And so I want to say to us tonight, this, uh, this afternoon, I said tonight, that as we celebrate this crop and bloom festival, we have to be recommitted to using what God blesses with judiciously. But also remember, it is not for you alone. Now, as I thought about this message today, which, by the way, is not a very long message. I want to make four points. I ask myself, what is it can solve the problems of hunger and inequalities and food deprivation and starvation in the world? What can solve the problem? I know there is so many people are talking now about the, you know, the cut 
to the universal credit, you know, a lot of that. That's a big thing now everywhere you go. And the hike in the prices of gases that will soon become evident this month. And people are bracing themselves for the worst. But folks, I want you to know that you can save a little bit more in your pocket if wastage is minimized. Because sometimes, I mean, even in this church, we sometimes waste. Uh, just living on the lights when we leave the sanctuary, when it could have gone off. And there is no one here. That's wastage. Living on the, ace, uh, the heater to run. You know, there are things we do that can help to minimize wastage. And particularly, God loves it. When his people do not eat all, but leave a little. Now, I used to wonder, why is it our four parents, even though they didn't go to school, or grandparents and great-grandparents, why God blessed them so? They didn't have no education, but they were blessed. Our parents were blessed. And I tell you why. The little they have. The little they have. They shed it. Listen, it's a fact of life. The more you keep, the less you have. The more you give. Now, I don't understand this arithmetic, this math, but the Bible said, give. And it what? It shall come back to good measures. Press down. Shaking together. Listen, folks. With God, you cannot outgive Him. And thus, there are some of us, we have to start giving more. And not just giving for giving's sake, but giving because there is a need. Now, I was asking the question, um, what will solve the problem of the inequalities in food in the world? And what will make us more equitable as a society? And I come up with four reasons, four things I want to share with you. Number one. The problem of sin, including hunger and starvation, deprivation, can only truly be remedied as men and women turn to holiness. You see, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I the Lord am holy. Now, God wanted not just the pastor or the elders. God wanted everyone, tooth bagai, everyone should be holy. You see, folks, only holy people can treat each other right. Holiness is not exclusive. Holiness is something that we should be adorned with. The problem in this world today is selfishness. You know, the rich tries to get richer. And the poor gets poorer. If we are contented, now we don't have to have the same amount. But if we are contented, this world can be a nice place. But the challenge is, is that men are seeking material things without seeking God. The cure for the ills of this world is not putting more money in our hands. The cure for the ills of this world is not putting more food on the table or in our food banks. The cure for this world is Jesus. Amen. You see, folks, I'm afraid that this world has abandoned God. We have left him out of our houses of parliament. We have left him out of our schools. God has been neglected. And hence the devil is wrecking havoc. 
all the starvation and earthquakes and tornadoes, they are the cause of evil. And that's why as a church, when we see people go to bed hungry every night, it should remind us that God still wants to call this world back to him. The cure for the ills of this world is in the holiness of God. God wants his people to seek for holiness. You see, when I am holy, I will treat my brother right. The closer I get to God, I will love you as a fellow human being. Point number two. Holy individuals give honor and respect to their parents. Reverence the Sabbath. And they do not fall trapped to idolatry or materialistic pursuits. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 3 and 4 says, I'm getting to where I want to go. Every one of you shall revere his mother and father. Now, it's interesting here that mother came first and not father. I thought the women would have said amen. There you know. The Bible said, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. So the mother came first. And you shall keep my Sabbaths. Do not turn to idols. Now, I've never seen an age where disrespect to parents is so high. There is a correlation between the ills in society and respect to elderly. Now, when parents are disrespected, that's what the Bible said. Honor what? Your mother and your father, that your days may be what? Long upon the land. And so, when children talk to parents like they are your best friend, and your mother is not your best friend, your father is not your best friend, they're your parent. And I don't care how educated you become and how big you have grown above them, you're still their child. I believe today, parents, children need, listen, p children, we are going to enjoy our old age better if we respect our parents. Because you see, what I do to my parents, my children come in behind me. You got to remember that, that when the Bible talks about living long, you see, sometimes we, we tend to divorce the issues in life, but there has been a breakdown. You talk, walk the street and hear children fighting with parents, talking to parents how they want. Well, I believe in the church, we need to encourage and endorse, and we should never tolerate disrespect to parents. The Bible said... That when each of you should revere his mother. Oh, you know, I was wondering why mother came first. But, you know, folks, you see mothers? God knows the trouble all you have to go through. And that's why, you know, the, you know we, you know, I don't mind a guy having a go with his father. But you see your mother? That's the last bulwark. Your mother. You know, we got we to gotta ensure that we protect our mothers. And so the Bible said, every one of you shall revere his mother and keep my Sabbaths. So there is a correlation between respecting your parents, respecting the Sabbath. Listen to me. The more the family is degraded in this world, the more starvation will increase. The more the Sabbath is denigrated, the more hunger and evil will increase. You see, folks, there is a correlation between the commandments of God and the prosperity of the land. Stay with me this morning. So the Bible said, Revere your mother, keep my Sabbaths, because 
when you respect your parents, you are recognizing that God has given them authority over you. They brought you here. When you honor the Sabbath, you are respecting the fact that God is your creator. But not just that. The Bible said, do not turn to idolatry. And so, uh, you know, when someone does not keep the Sabbath, do not respect the parents, materialism will become your God. And that's why today, brothers and sisters, this world is so preoccupied with selfishness. Because men have turned their backs on God. The Sabbath is disregarded. How can we fix the problems of this world outside of God? I want to sound a loud cry to our politicians today that we need to take society back to God. God can fix it better than policies. God can fix it better than all the mechanisms we put in place because the answer to this world is in the Bible. I don't know. We have tried all agencies. We have tried all policies. Yet we have not Try the word of God. I'm convinced that righteousness will exalt a nation. I've never seen the Bible fail us yet. And yet the devil is keeping us from going and doing what the Bible says. So today, as we celebrate Harvest Festival, we need to go back to the basics. And let me get quickly on to where I'm going this morning. Point number three, holiness demands that, of course, the first point I made, that man become holy, that we respect our parents, reverence the Sabbath, and do not fall to the trap of materialism. But holiness also demands that we respect what belongs to God. Whatever is set apart by God must be used in a way that he prescribed it. In Leviticus 19, verse 5 to 8, the Bible says, When you offer a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it. Um, and whatever is left the next day, but by the third day you shall burn it. In other words, God doesn't want his children to waste what they brought to him. That's why he said, when you bring an offering... Eat whatever you bring. That's the peace offering. And don't keep it beyond the third day. By then it will be spoiling. The point here, we should avoid wastage. Whatever, whatever we bring to the Lord, he doesn't want us to waste it. He doesn't want us to waste it. Now, now, now the point I am getting to is here. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19. So the, 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 the 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Now, I want you to note what God said earlier. He said, remember I am holy. Remember to respect your parents. Remember to keep the Sabbath. Remember do not commit idolatry. When you bring an offering to me, bring exactly what I need. And then, when you plant your field, do not reap everything. Leave the edges. Let me tell you this, folks. I've recognized that we sometimes treat the poor with contempt. Poor thing, we say. And let me tell you, we need to treat the poor with integrity. Because you see, God places them among us to help us. And in Leviticus chapter 19, God said, when you go to your harvest festival, when you go to your, to your plantation and you are reaping and an air of corn falls to the ground, don't pick it up. When grapes and the wheat fall, leave it on the ground because the poor doesn't have to come to you and ask. They shouldn't be coming and beg you. They should be coming and reap what you left. Now, this is rather interesting this morning. Uh, I'm not going to stay too long on this because this is rather interesting. The Israelites 
were not to glean the corners of the fields. They were to leave whatever was dropped on the ground. The workers were not to go back and sweep again because God had a mechanism in the world to take care of those who are in need. You see, brothers and sisters, we do not have to believe. The poor is never a burden to us because God has given us enough. I don't know how much apples your mouth could hold one time. Now, I know there's a guy who I saw eating a lot of apples. He tried to stuff two in his mouth. But, you know, you can only put one spoon in your mouth, you know. You know, um, I don't know who eats with two spoons in their mouth. But God only gives us sufficient that we can eat now. And so what you have and you think is a lot, it is not necessarily for you alone. In fact, the next time you go home and you sit at your table, you must think, who is out there? Can do with this. I have some things in my house. No, the, the dates should never expire on food. Bring it to CHH before it expires. Because there are people in this world that can do with it. Now, the Bible says, when you reap in your field, leave the edges. So that when the poor people come, they don't have to come and ask you for it. And, and let you feel sorry for them. Because God understands that even though some people are poor, they still have their pride. Even though some people are less fortunate, they still have dignity. And that's why sometimes when you give something to someone in need, don't tell nobody about it. Nobody should know about it because persons still have their dignity. I know sometimes we like the world to know what we've done. But listen to me, your left hand don't have to know what your right hand doing. There are some things that only in heaven, God will reward you. Uh, because, you see folks, we have to help people and help to maintain their integrity. That's why God said, left what's behind, don't go back and pick it up. Let them come in the night when nobody look in and gather it. At least they'll have some food. But you see folks, I've recognized today. That, uh, and, and, and I don't mind what we do sometimes, but sometimes we have to help people when the cameras have gone. We need to help people when there is no recognition to be given. We have to help people when nobody else is looking. Because, you see, folks, when God blesses us, the blessings he gives to us is for you to brighten the corner of somebody else's lives. And as I look, as I look in Romans chapter 15, the Bible said, we who are, are strong have an obligation to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. You see, holiness when I am holy, I am not just pleasing God. But when I am holy, I will look for the needs around me. I will ensure that when I reap, even if it's a few potatoes, I will think of my neighbor. I will think of that brother who has children. That mother who is a single parent. You see, what God blesses you with, little might be little for you. But a little can be much for somebody else. That's why this morning, as we celebrate this Harvest Festival, we cannot celebrate without thinking of the many people who go to bed hungry every night. That's why as a church, as a church, we have to ensure that we are always here to help people. They say, Pastor, well, 
How come the church is always in the community? Well, you see, we're preparing for the final exam. On the final exam in Matthew 25, have you fed the hungry? Have you clothed the naked? Have you what? Visited those in prison? The Lord is not going to ask me how much church board I chair. He won't ask me how much sermons I preach. Hey, listen to me, those things are good, but in the final analysis, God wants us to touch people's lives. That's why as a church, we have to be recommitted to impacting our community. So today, today God said to Moses, as I come to an end now, and I'm doing well today, you know, it's three minutes to one, and I'm almost finished. I think I'm beating Ella Allen today because I started late. <coughs> I started late, you know, but I'm going well today. God said to God said to the children of Israel, when you reap, don't gather everything. Don't eat all. Leave a little. Don't use all. Leave a little. Always remember. There is someone to come behind you. And with children, I recognize you have to teach them that. I always wonder why my mother never made me take out food when I was a little boy. Because she knew that little young teenage boys could eat the whole house. <coughs> so if she sent me in the pot... Others coming behind me would find nothing. And that's why she said, let me share the food. And you eat what I put there for you. You know, folks, we have to remember others when we are eating. And not just physical food. Remember others when God blesses you. Remember others when you have gotten an increase from the Lord. Remember others when the blessings of God is pouring down. Don't just think about yourself. Don't just eat everything you're given. Leave something for those behind you. And I'm not just talking about for your children. I'm talking about for those who are poor and destitute. Those that you have no connection to. Leave a little for them. Because you know what? In helping the poor, you are helping God. That's why he said in Matthew 25, those of you who have done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Today as a church, we have to not just celebrate harvest, but we are recommitting ourselves to put a smile on people's face. And making our community a place where no one should go to bed hungry. My dream, my hope is that this church can be a church where someone can walk off the street any day and come for a plate of food. They should, you know, you know that's what churches should be like. Making an impact in our community. Because I believe that we are here to make a difference. In the lives of others. And so as we celebrate our crop and bloom harvest festival, let's not just thank God for the harvest that he has given to us, but let us share a little with those around us making a difference in their lives. Let us pray. Father in heaven, today, oh God, we thank you for blessing our hands with good gifts. But we recognize today, Lord, that the good things that you've given to us is not for us alone. The harvest that we have reaped with our hands is not just simply for us to enjoy. Help us not to eat all. Live a little. A little for that poor brother, that poor mother. A little for that widow down the road. A little for that household that doesn't have much. Help us to think of somebody today that we can impact and make a difference 
in Jesus' name.